Well, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you to Sir Tony for bringing us all together. It's wonderful to have these, these gatherings again. Now, I uh, have the wonderful task of moderating uh, a panel that's going to ask the question, what role can technology play uh, in delivering a progressive future. Uh, and our guests are experts, so I won't take up any more of your time. They're experts who straddle the world of emerging technologies, of large businesses, uh, and the entrepreneurial uh, economy. So our first panelist is the managing partner of McKinsey and Company in uh, the UK and Ireland, uh, the chair of Teach First and the chair of the Black Equity Organization, someone who has uh, an unparalleled view about how big business thinks about this transformation. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have uh, Dame Vivian Hunt with us today. How are you? Can I ask you to sit over here? Yeah, wonderful. And then joining us uh, is a real expert in building virtual worlds. Uh, a uh, man who understands the metaverse really probably more than anyone else uh, in the country and likely soon to be a successful author with his first booking book coming out in uh, October. So please welcome Herman Narula, the founder of Improbable. <laughs> Hi Herman, how are you? Uh, and finally, we're not going to get to the future without uh, new companies uh, and new founders. And we've found uh, the best person possible to come and talk about how we create uh, startups. Uh, he is uh, a creator of startups. He is a nurturer of entrepreneurial talent. Uh, the founder, a uh, co-founder of Entrepreneur First, uh, with his first book coming out uh, in September as well. Uh, please welcome Matt Clifford. Hi, Matt. This is Steve. This. Great. Well, perhaps let's start with a little bit of a, of a level set. Uh, because, you know, we're talking about technology. We're giving it this uh, importance today. Uh, what is it about today's technologies that make them special? Matt, perhaps you'd like to take a pitch. Yeah, I think the way I would frame this is in, in 1987, the Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Solow famously said something along the lines of, you can see the impact of the computer age everywhere except the productivity statistics. And this became a sort of the basis or, or rather, you know, a sort of um, good summary of a critique that for the quarter century that uh, came after that, a lot of people shared, you know, people like Peter Thiel popularized the idea, you know, we were promised flying cars and we got 140 characters. And so this general idea that we were living through an age where the world of bits had been transformed and the worlds of atoms had been neglected became very popular. I think what's special today is that doesn't seem to be a sustainable critique anymore. And in fact, what we're seeing, I think, right now is a series of exponential technologies, to use your phrase, uh, that are actually taking progress in the world of bits and transforming the world of atoms. And I think you see that across such a wide range of uh, fields, from drug discovery through to building virtual worlds, that I think we're in an age where the critique that technology is not really having an impact on the things that matter just no longer holds. Vivid, from the perspective of, of your of big business, would they understand what Matt has described? Well, let's assume that you've got some uh, real innovators and technologists who can build the environment on which businesses can operate. And we can talk about the ethics and the trust base around that. But for it to work in businesses, it has to be able to be applied. You know, the best technologies in the world, the best medical solutions in the world, if you can't apply them in the day-to-day -day basis, if you can't actually reach scale, say, in the public sector, if you can't impact education, the way Peter was referring to earlier, then having these miraculous technologies and metaverses don't matter because they're actually not impacting outcomes. So if you can take these technologies and use them to deliver, innovate goods and services that are personalized, you know, deeply in relevant ways, doesn't matter whether it's private or public sector, that will add a huge amount of value. If they can manage complexity in a transparent and ethical way, that will add a huge amount of value because each of our lives and journeys, you know, as we can tell by what's tailored on our telephones, incredibly different one to the other. And finally, if it can be governed by a set of principles, policies, ethics that actually, um, you know, look at the externalities and some of the unequal outcomes that happen as a result of these technologies being implemented. Mm -hmm. 
one example, you know, technology investments in metaverse wealth creation evolving very quickly, but you know, so far only 4% of that is with female-led founders. And if you scale that, you might scale the metaverse, but you don't want to scale that anomaly um, any worse than it already is in tech. So I just use that as one example to say it's how it's applied in the public and private sector that will determine whether it's really transformational. I, I, thank you. You've set, set up the rest of the dis discussion uh, for us as well wonderfully. How is it applied? We'll focus on that. But, but Herman, briefly, uh, you're building the metaverse and metaverse-style technologies. How do they contribute to this, this transformation? I mean, isn't it simply about finding better ways for us to spend our time when, rather than watching TV? Aren't you competing with Netflix rather than uh, creating a new industry? Why do people go to work? Separate from the need to do so, why do they do it? Psychology tells us that it's because of the desire for fulfillment. This notion of fulfillment is what drives basically every non-essential thing human beings do. And fulfillment requires fulfilling experiences. And you don't have a fulfilling experience when you consume media. You have it when you interact with other people, when you accomplish something, when you make a meaningful choice. People who are 12 to 18 years old right now, they aren't looking at the, way, the world at all the way that you and I are looking at the world. When I grew up, online dating was weird. Now it's weird to not online date. Um, you know, 12 to 18 year olds now, they don't look at virtual experiences as virtual experiences, they're just experiences. They come home from school and hang out with their friends and make new ones and earn incomes inside these spaces. So I would say that rather than emphasizing which particular technology is going to enable this or not, the really important thing to think about is our culture is changing. And people have an expectation for more fulfillment. They need greater fulfillment. How will we provide that to them? You know, productivity, I think, was the, was the sort of watchword of the last 100 years. The next 100 years is about giving every person that opportunity for fulfillment. Because if they don't get it, what psychology also tells us, and I'll end on this point, if things go very wrong, if people don't feel like participants in society, if they don't feel like they're having meaningful experiences that grow them, it doesn't matter if they have a income, it doesn't matter if they have a job, something in them is unfulfilled, and that creates all sorts of social problems. Wonderful. The beauty of those first answers are that they do carry out a wonderful survey of the key issues, the productivity, the questions of fulfillment and meaning, the questions of uh, equity and fairness and inclusion. So let's work our way through them. I'm sorry, we're gonna go back to productivity, uh, Herman, because Britain has found itself for many, many years with this, this product, in a productivity funk. Compared to uh, other countries, our productivity has not been growing uh, as much as, as, as peers. Even though we do seem to be rather digitally savvy, we have a very strong entrepreneurial ecosystem, we have very strong homegrown talent. Uh, what would, what could technology, these technologies, contribute to improving our productivity and productivity growth in the UK uh, over the coming years? Perhaps, Vivian, we'll come to you first. Well, it, it's very clear that, and I'll, I'll maybe talk about essential services, many of which are provided in the public sector, and then mm. take an example from the private sector. Um, there are many, many ways in which the need for digital applications and at scale improvements in the public sector would be transformational in terms of reach, outcomes, and impact. And our productivity problem isn't just only in the, in the private sector in terms of how you move from startups to scale ups and other examples that are, are well known and well trailed, but we've also got a public sector mm -hmm. productivity problem. Um, no less so, particularly because of the essential nature of the services they provide and the huge number of jobs they employ. I always use the statistic that the NHS is you know, there to provide services and benefits for all, but it's also a massive employer mm -hmm. in its own right um, of a very diverse workforce at all levels of technology and capability. So if you think about applying some of the technologies that um, um, our Lord Darcy was mentioning earlier, that's transformational for the people who are working as tech staff around the theater room, no different than the surgical and surgical teams who are applying some of the technologies he was sharing. It's really transformational at workflow and process and basic provision of public services, but also in enabling uh, much more access and affordable reach mm. for you know, the strained and, and, and heavily pressured public purse that we have. So it can provide a pretty transformational answer. No different on the private sector side of healthcare, mm. but just to stay with that example, yeah. where you know, we can move many of our businesses from startup and scale up to an increasing global relevance and competitiveness. So 
but, but all of that well, would, would be you know, a net gain to our productivity, but also for the, the British public purse. But why is it different this time around in 2022? Why can we be optimistic about productivity gains from technology when we've had 50 years of the micro, microprocessor revolution and we haven't seen, necessarily seen those productivity gains, at least not in the statistics? So what is it about now that, that gives you confidence that these things will, can make a difference and we can act suitably to do that? Well, if the principles of, of, of getting the personalization and managing the complexity, whether it be a public sector or a private sector, whether it's the essential part of your services or your discretionary choices, you could now manage if you had good AI, good data, and ethical decision making around it. No different in the public sector than the private sector. So if you think about what drives productivity plateaus, it's not just the fact that you know, microprocessing computing power is what you do with the decisions around that. So it's how we apply it that'll give us the next productivity curve. Matt, is that how you, you think of that, about this? I think, there's a, I think there's a few things here. I, I think it's very easy to talk about you know, technology as being the sort of uh, genie that will, that will save us. But um, as Vivian said in her opening remarks, actually, it's the application of that. And I think you know, one thing that there's a lot of evidence for in the UK is that actually our you know, less well-performing businesses are just not even implement. It's not about implementing AI. It's about implementing you know email or PowerPoint. <laughs> um, and I think this is. I know this is like not really the theme of the panel, but I think that's a huge issue for the UK. Is just how do we actually get you know not 2022 technologies, but you know 1992 technologies fully implemented across across the country. There's particularly a problem outside London, which is obviously a big. Um, you know, a big theme in you know the um, conversation about the economy at the moment. The, the, the only thing I would add, though, to, to, to maybe get to more of the, the cutting edge, um, is I think one of the things that is a challenge is that although this country, as you sort of hinted at in your question, has historically you know been very good at science, I think it's really easy to be complacent about that. And, and actually, I think we face a, a global scientific uh, stagnation problem where good ideas are getting harder to find. Uh, and how you measure that is, you know, for, for every breakthrough uh, discovery, how many people, how many scientists, and how much money has to be poured into the system mm -hmm. to make that work. And that actually is a really scary thing. If you want to feel pessimistic about the world, how much harder good ideas are, are getting to find is, is, is like one of the things to focus on. Now, I, my optimistic answer is, I think that's partly because we've got so much scientific knowledge now. Mm -hmm. So to make breakthroughs, you have to understand an awful lot more. You know, we could call this the burden of knowledge. And I think part of the answer to that is actually the technologies that we probably do want to talk about today. Like, no, you can't, as a scientist anymore, read the entire corpus of your discipline. But guess what? A machine learning model can and can actually direct you to sort of key insights and key ideas. And I think what we need to be thinking about uh, when it comes to scientific productivity is how do we use the tools of emerging technologies to give us superpowers uh, to make our most productive people even more productive? I suppose one problem will be who is given those superpowers. And in, in Herman's introduction, you draw attention to uh, the, the, the issues of fulfillment and therefore engagement in, in technology. If people don't feel fulfilled, they won't engage in, in their public role. How do you think about questions of social inclusion, especially given that the technologies that you are building are really on that cutting edge? They have really found themselves to be particularly skewed across various demographic and access categories? So I'd say, first of all, there are a lot of myths around things like gaming and virtual worlds. There's a huge divide in understanding. There's about 3 billion gamers in the world. The average age of a gamer is about 34. The split between men and women is actually more even than not. Um, young girls play games seemingly just as much as young boys do, different games, and with different uh, desires of fulfillment, it seems, in different demographics. I think we. When we talk about equity and we talk about the distribution of this productivity, we can wander very quickly into a myth that has been proven wrong time and time again, which is the myth of the upgrade. New technology like this, AI for research, for example, is, is not just going to magically upgrade existing practitioners. It's going to result in the very same types of disruption that have led to bricks and mortar stores being replaced by e-commerce retailers and so forth. And I think we're due ever more of these shocks and trying to preserve legacy businesses and their ability to be effective when competing with new companies fully aligned around these types of um, technologies. I think it's going to be very challenging indeed. Lastly, I also think you know, thinking purely in terms of a national market and, and Britain 
is once again quite out of date. You know, the biggest, most powerful companies in the world, the most important networks in the world are entirely international now. We have to think about the fact that we're going to be one node in a network of interconnected markets. Our entrepreneurs, our, our businesses, are not looking at the UK market as their end destination, nor are their VCs. So it's all about access to rapid access to a global market if you really want to see major platform companies emerge in the UK. Is, uh, Vivian, is rapid access to these new technologies during these moments of disruption and industries being left behind, is that sufficient to deliver a social inclusion that might be desirable? Or there are, are there other specific measures that we might need to consider? Well, certainly the issue about skills, um, readiness, and availability. Because if you think about a person from um, a poor socioeconomic background, um, and that it impacts some uh, groups communities uh, more deeply than others, the world that they might experience in their virtual world as a digital native, the businesses they might dream of starting that their parents, grandparents may never have heard of, but is what they aspire to, they need the right skill sets to be able to access those. So you've got to be able to do sort of three things. One is provide a basic level of access and services to support those who don't have the access to the education, skills, and resources to be able to even think about how do I have an income, a job, and a fulfilling mm -hmm. contribution to society. And if I can't find, at age 16, employment or training or something that puts me on a path in the um, real world, and that real world, by the way, is virtual to them, but then I might have to look at my alternatives, because I'm going to have to support myself and have an income. Yeah. And so that need to get essential services in a stable, less fragile work, quality work that you can sustain. This isn't about getting wealthy. It's not about getting, I'm not even talking about home ownership. I'm just saying it's stability and security, physical security, psychological security, and skill security so that you can even get started. Technology can help, but most young people who don't have um, mm. access to economic means know how to do that. Secondly, their dreams are much bigger than mine might have been, and they will be accessing in this world. And so the notion of can we give them the skills that almost sort of leapfrog the ones that you use in the analog world so that you could prepare them to build businesses, small businesses even, you know, but to be able to support themselves in the virtual world that'll be much more their reality. So remembering that the enabling conditions to even get started around, you know, sustainable work and a healthy contribution to the economy are often missing from um, many of the poorest communities and we need to provide that before even any of these young people can actually enter the world that they dream about and that they experience already. One of the things, Matt, that you do is you take young people and uh, in, your, in this environment, uh, it's a free range, organic nurse hatchery for unicorns, uh, is that you, you give these, these, these young people uh, greater skills and, and they, they build, build success from it. But to what extent, what have you learned in the last decade about the uh, the, the demographics, the, the structural advantages of the people who come through your program. And following on from that, to, to Vivian's point about, you know, how do you tool up people who don't necessarily have economic or structural advantage to participate in this new digital economy? How do you think about broadening access through to the uh, Entrepreneur First programs? So the first thing I'd say is I think we have a huge macroeconomic talent allocation problem in the UK. Um, I may alienate, I don't know, uh, where the audience uh, work day to day, but you know, I, I think it is a really challenging dynamic for the UK that the standard ambition paths for people coming out of university uh, to go and work in finance in the UK. Like why, you know, Silicon Valley has a lot of advantages, but one of its biggest ones is that the obvious default career path for an ambitious person graduating from Stanford is to go and build a technology company, or failing that, go work in a high growth technology company. And I think that uh, there is this very dangerous myth that entrepreneurs are really different and weird. I've never found any piece of evidence that this is true. All the characteristics that predict success in entrepreneurship are more or less the characteristics that predict success in any other walk of life. In fact, there are some incredible studies on this, that in years where banks in the UK hire fewer people, we get more entrepreneurs. Now, OK, that makes sense. We think of them forced into entrepreneurship. Presumably, they're worse. No, they have better outcomes than people that uh, start companies in years where banks hire more. In other words, the people that you know, Silicon Valley might, you know, on a bad day, say, oh, these are suits, 
they're actually just entrepreneurs who didn't think of starting companies. And, and what we know is that all entrepreneurship is is a high talent, high skill vocation. And so the simplest way to have more and better companies, to increase the supply of the kinds of companies we're talking about, is to make entrepreneurship a legitimate, prestigious, exciting career path that when you tell your parents you're turning down a job from Goldman Sachs or even McKinsey, um, they're like, yeah, that's great, um, rather than what the, are you doing, right? Um, and so I, I think to answer your question, um, one big challenge is we don't in the UK celebrate Role, entrepreneurial role models. Like we are still talking, it's 2022, you ask people to name entrepreneurs today, Richard Branson, Alan Sugar, and David Beckham, the three names that are named most in the UK. Not Herman Narula, and you know, like, I, I think that is a huge challenge. When was the last piece of popular culture that you saw in the UK that presented entrepreneurship in a positive light, that said these are the people that build and change our world? We don't have them. And so like, yes, there are absolutely specific access issues around certain demographic groups, but it's actually the, the single biggest way to reach those groups is to wildly expand the top of the funnel. Let's start telling people that entrepreneurship is great uh, and that it's a legitimate, desirable career path for the world's most ambitious people. But is it really about telling the stories uh, about Evan uh, or Elon uh, or, or Mark? Or if we're trying to transform society in an inclusive way, it's about perhaps not an entrepreneur, but being a business person, being able to engage with those, those tools. I mean, I, th I think, Vivian, through your other roles, you mm. have wide, wide, wide access to people from different walks of life, different experiences. Is the right concoction to say, you too can be Elon Musk? Or is the right concoction to say, you too can build a successful business that's digitally enabled uh, in my old hometown of South Bend on Sea? <coughs> Well, I think you've got to believe the latter for the former to be the case, because at some point, Elon Musk was probably, you know, a slightly weird, socially isolated kid with some big ideas Waltz. that no one <laughs> can understand. So, so my point is, you can take the, you know, the hyper-isolation of the old model of building a business in your garage and transform it to what young people want to do online and normalize it. And you do need to see entrepreneurs of diverse backgrounds and profiles from all across society to actually believe that you can do it. So I celebrate all of those different models. We just need to celebrate the diversity of them, large and small, not just the ones that are the biggest and most wealthy. The, the mm. second comment I'd say is we can expand the talent pool. I absolutely agree with that. But we also have to pull some people up as we go, because there are communities for whom, even if you show it to them, they're not going to trust that that's an environment in which they can be successful. And you see that with female entrepreneurs. Um, ethnic minority communities, people who are working on businesses across platforms. And so I just think we have to not only open the funnel, but specifically pull forward different profiles so that they can actually see that that can be successful for them. Herman. I, I feel like I agree with a lot of what's said, but I feel once again, we're talking about a world that was five years ago, 10 years ago, pre-pandemic. Um, you don't even have to tell people your name to be a billionaire entrepreneur now. Do you know who Satoshi Nakamoto is? Nobody does, he started Bitcoin. Um, in the Web3 world, there are communities formed where people are sharing the profits of very different kinds of organizations, decentralized organizations. Um, you know, we talk about Silicon Valley versus London. It doesn't matter anymore. My company is on remote, remote work now. So does everybody. I have a few friends who I won't name who have two jobs in two different companies. Nobody even knows. Um, or, you know, <laughs> working, working, working remotely. More Guys, I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I know we don't have much time left, but I really, if there's one message I think in all of this I want to get across is it is comforting to think that the models, the experience, and the tools that we've all been equipped with over the last sort of you know, 10, 15 years of seeing technology grow up have armed us for what is about to happen. But they aren't. They, they aren't very useful at all. And I think we have to start with primary sources again. We have to start looking at where the innovation is really happening, what's really going on, especially in this post-pandemic space. You know, anywhere there's a mobile phone, there's going to be a job now. My co-founder paid his way through college from a poor part of Liverpool by selling things in a video game. You know, no CV, no qualification. It's a weird new world, and we should legislate and plan and invest in that one, not some like half-remembered 2001 Silicon Valley world, which is dead now, gone now. We're very short of time now, so I'm going to put one question for each of you to, to respond to. Uh, for this audience that is a, a, a broad audience from both the public and the private sector, so if there was one specific takeaway, thing that they could go off and do that move some of these issues forward, uh, what would that be? And you 
each have about 10 or 12 seconds to give that answer. We'll start. Herman needs a breather after that excellent <laughs> answer. So, uh, Matt, if we start with you, come to Vivian, and then over to Herman. Well, I think, I think if you have children, um, tell them stories about entrepreneurs. That would be my, that'd be my one. Thank you. Vivian. Inclusion and equity matter in the outcomes. And so take that lens on all of your investments, public and private. Thank you. Herman? Take every single consultancy-driven report about the near future that has been sent to you in your inbox, move to trash. <laughs> <laughs> Then pull out your phone, pull out your phone, and actually go and use the products and services that your kids are using. Because if you don't do that, you, you may as well just you know, try to write music without being able to hear or even look at it. Thank you very much. And please, thank you to all our panelists. Thank you very much.